Good morning, Mount Olive. It's good to be here with you this morning. <clears throat> we got quite a few announcements. Before we do that, um, I want to welcome any visitors that we might have today. We thank you so much for coming. Take the flap of your bulletin and fill it out. Put an offering plate when it comes around in a minute. And uh, let us know that you're here because we want to get back with you very soon. I've uh, got a couple of things this morning. Um, this um, Thursday night, uh, we're, our children are going to be going on a skate party to uh, um, skaters. That's the old Aloha in Boonville. And that'll be from 6.30 to 8.30. Just, just be there at 6.30 and uh, don't have to bring any money or anything. And that'll, that'll, and that'll, that'll be a good children's event. Don't forget about our, wind, our, our winter Bible study starting next Sunday night at 5.30. Going through next Wednesday night. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll meet everybody. We'll meet here at 5.30 on that Sunday. And uh, with Dr. Ronald Meeks, we're going to look, at, look forward to having a good time. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'll meet at 6.30. Our Annie Armstrong Easter is starting um, this morning. And uh, in just a minute, I'm going to show, let's, let's go to that video now. Uh, there's a video for Annie Armstrong this morning. Can you hear it? Can you hear the call? The call to all the nations here in our very own. The beating hearts of missionaries being sent all across North America. It's the sound of the waters parting with an outstretched arm of redemption. It's the sound of worlds colliding like galaxies in the universe. It's the sound of the recollection of forgotten souls. The sound of His kingdom being shaped from the dust. The sound of restoration amongst broken hearts. And the sound of a chorus between meager verses. It's in the reverberations of every tongue and every tribe, from sea to shining sea. Can you hear it? Here and now? The support received through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering is used to empower and equip missionaries in North America. Will you join together with us? Because there is much work to be done. Here and now. Again, our Annie Armstrong Easter offering goal is $3,500. And we'll take that up through this month, of course, and then on into April if, if we need to. Um, tonight... Uh, we'll have our youth will be going out to eat right after service, so youth be here. Uh, we'll head out and go to Tupelo right after the service tonight. Um, uh, the Easter egg hunt for our church will be um, Saturday, uh, March the 31st at 10 a.m. here at the church. Don't put that, put that on the count. Don't forget about that. And uh, the Go Tail Crusade is April the 15th to the 18th. And uh, there's a lot of ways to help with that. If you want to help in any way, um, see Amanda Frederick or Sterling Yerber, and they can get you signed up, matched up to some way. But one way will be choir. They'll have a community choir on that Sunday evening of the April the 15th. And if you want to be a part of that, they're going to have a practice on Thursday night, March the 27th at 630 at Vineyard Church up on the highway. So if you want to be a part of that choir, that, that community choir, that will be on March the 22nd at 630. Um, and then one last thing, um, announcement-wise, is our, just kind of let you know about our Easter service changes um, that week. Uh, we will not have Wednesday night services, but we will have a 7 o'clock Thursday night service. Uh, we will be taking the Lord's Supper and, and things here at the church on that Thursday night. Then on, we'll have an 8 a.m. breakfast on Easter morning, followed by 945 worship in the sanctuary. And, uh, and then there will be no evening, evening services that evening. And I do want to recognize that the flowers this morning were placed in loving memory of Bobby James um, by his wife, Miss Brenda. And then we want to have a word of prayer, please. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, Father God, thank you again so much for this day. Um, God, thank you so much that you've given us the opportunity to be in this wonderful place. 
Um, God, we just thank you um, that um, even in the midst of storms of life, God, that, that you are still present, always present, and God, that you're always there with us. And Father, I pray that this morning, God, that will be a consistent theme in our lives and our hearts, God, that we will always run to you, God, we will search you, we will try you this morning, God, that we will be directed by you, Father, that you be with Brother Anthony and you be with Brother Stanley as they serve in our service this morning, God, that, that these two men, God, will... Uh, that you will honor their preparation, and God, that you will speak through them and use them this morning how you see fit. God, we pray that our church will, 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 will do what you ask us to do. God, we will um, be disciplined to, 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 to live in the way that you ask us to live, to live in a righteous and holy way. God, as a church, that we will follow after you, that God, that we will do things that you ask us to do, that we won't be, we will have the courage and the bravery to stand where we need to stand. And, and God, to do the things that you want. Father, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much that we have an opportunity because of the death of Jesus, because of the sacrifice of your one and only son. We have an opportunity to know you personally. God, and I pray that for every person in this sanctuary this morning, that everybody in here will have a personal relationship with you. And God, we pray that in your son's name, in that name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Y'all stand. Let's have a time of fellowship, please. <laughs> All right, so good to see you this morning. Let's sing this morning three verses of O Worship the King. can wash away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus.
for him this morning, I am resolved. That is 301 in your hymnal. I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing the first and last verse.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my change. ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace We're going to take our text from Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah, I'm going to read two passages, one in chapter 56, the other in 57, because it's sort of a continuation of the topic that I'll be preaching on this morning, and I'll entitle my message, Everyone Needs God. Everyone Needs God. I remember the second time I had the flu, the second time in my life I had the flu. Uh, My wife was expecting our daughter. And I just, uh, I was really sick. I'd had a high fever, and that was very unusual for me because I can count, even to this day, I can count 
probably on one hand how many times I've had fever in my life. And when I have just a little bit of fever, um, it puts me down. And my fever was very high. And I decided that I needed to work, so I went ahead and worked that day. And I uh, got home, and I was just had chills. I don't know how I made it through the day, actually. I mean, I, I was just really, really sick. And that night, laying in the bed, I remember my fever was high, and I just had chills. I began to get nauseated. I laid there as long as I could. Finally jumped up, went to the bathroom. I didn't turn the light on. There was a little stool there that our son used to stand on to brush his teeth. I tripped over that. I fell. Judy came rushing in, turned the light on. I was laying there on my back, just addled looking, you know, and I think she thought I was about a goner, and I felt like I really was. And all because I was just uh, too, uh, too self-sufficient to go to the doctor. But I found out. Uh, you heard that amen from my wife? Ooh, ooh that stung. <laughs> she's right, she's right. Uh, so I went to the doctor the next day. I had, to admit, I had to admit that I needed some help beyond what I could do for myself. And what I found out in my life is that so often I must admit that I need help beyond what I can do. Uh, spiritually, I need God. You know, spiritually I need him. I need him every hour. I can't even walk without him holding my hand. I need my heavenly father to help me through. And when I refuse to let him help me, it's nothing more than what the Bible says is pride. Pride. And as God's speaking to the Israelites in the Old Testament through the book of Isaiah, 66, it's divided into 66 wonderful chapters. Um, Much prophecy about the Messiah uh, it's, Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. Um, although the people had disobeyed God and sinned and they were going into captivity, God always balances that judgment with hope. And the book being divided into to three sections, basically chapters 1 through 39 and then 40 through 55 and 55 or 56 through 66, which uh, in that section talks of the great hope that we have in God and the restoration that he plans for his people. Nevertheless, he reminds them of how prideful they'd been. He reminds them that uh, their idol worship was all due to pride. It was all due to self-sufficiency. It was all due to the fact that they thought they could do it all themselves, and they didn't need God. They didn't, didn't need a heavenly father. It reminds me much of a parable that Jesus told in the New Testament in Luke chapter 18. And uh, in, in that uh, parable, Jesus said this. He spoke to some um, trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And then he said, two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. He said the Pharisee stood and prayed with, with himself or in himself and said, I thank thee, God, that I am not like other men extortioners, adulterers, uh, unjust. Um, he, he, um, this man said, I thank you, I'm not like other men, or even like this tax collector. He said, I fast twice a week, I give of all that I have. But the tax collector, Jesus said, was standing far He wouldn't even so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he smote his chest and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He recognized his need of God and that because he was sinful, he needed the mercy of God. He needed God's forgiveness and God's grace and God's mercy. And Jesus said that this tax collector went down to his house justified rather than the other. For Jesus said, everyone who exalts himself, that is, has pride in himself, will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so I want to share with you today that we all need God. Though the prideful feel like they don't need God, but God blesses the humble who realize that they do need God. So if you're able to stand this morning, I'll ask you to do so as we honor the reading of God's Word. Chapter 56, Isaiah, we'll begin reading in verse 9 and go through verse 12. All you beasts of the field come to devour. All you beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs which, which never have enough. 
And they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his own gain, from his own territory. Come, one says, I will bring wine, and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today, and much more abundant. Now in chapter 57, we'll begin reading in verse number 10. And you are, we- uh, you are wearied in the length of your way, yet you did not say there is no hope. You have found the life of your hand, therefore you were not grieved. And of whom have you been afraid or feared that you have lied and not remembered me, nor taken it to your heart? Is it not because I have held my peace from of old that you do not fear me? I will declare your righteousness and your works, for they will not profit you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. But the wind will carry them all away, a breath will take them. But he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. And one shall say, heap it up, heap it up. Prepare the way, take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus says the high and lofty one who who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the spirit would fail before me in the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness, I was angry and struck him. I hid and was angry, and he went on backsliding in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him who is afar off and to him who is near, says the Lord. And I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Father, thank you for your precious word today and for the healing that you give us, not only in body, but more importantly, in soul and spirit. You are our Father. You are our resting place. You are our source of comfort and strength in time of trouble. You are our help when we humble ourselves before you, Father. When our spirit is lowly and contrite. When we cry out to you, you hear our prayer. When we pray thus within ourselves. That we are good. And that we are not like others. Then your word tells us there is no justification for that. We thank you for the peace that you give us. Through your precious word. Through your Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. For your great mercy and love. Thank you, Father. Speak now to us, Lord. Teach us truths. And help us to obey your word simply because we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I remember um, witnessing to a young lady several years ago. And it just felt like that... um, what she needed in life she could get for herself and she could get from someone else. I tried to share with her that there's no, there's no one on this earth that can fill our need like Jesus can fill our need. There's no one who can be all that they ought to be by themselves, trusting in themselves or even trusting in others unless they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah Begins this section with a condemnation of idolatry and unbelief, a condemnation of prideful thinking and prideful living. He records the heart of the man, 13. His love is towards those who will humble themselves before him and call out to him in time of great need. And that would be every one of us, for we are all in great need every moment of every day. God intends in this passage to heal a nation. And that's what he's talking about. To the nation of Israel, to his people, to his children, he intends to give them healing and comfort and strength. He is their God and he is the one who has brought them through the great exodus out of their bondage and freed them to live for him and to trust him and to follow him 
in everything. They were a nation who basically we might say today had, who had gone to pot, believing and trusting in idols. God said, cry out to your idols and see if they can deliver you. Call out to them and see if any one of them will come to your rescue. And yet when we call out to God, we know that he always comes to our rescue. We find a pathway for individuals who, uh, who are damaged. <laughs> and that would be all of us. Pride damages us. It does. It damages our spiritual life. It damages our relationships. It, it damages every part of our lives. As we look at the passage, and especially in verses 9 to 12 of, of uh, chapter 56, we find that Isaiah describes those destructive effects of pride, of sin, on a person's relationship with God. When it happens, we become disoriented. We, we get out of, out of where God wants us to be. We fall away from His will and away from, from His strength and His help. When we look for what we need in the wrong places, when we look for it within ourselves or through something the world has to offer, we become damaged. Verses 9 and first part of verse 10 in uh, chapter 56 talks of a blindness. It, it speaks of a blindness that, that we have. If you'll look at that with me, uh, verse 10, his watchmen, the Bible says, are blind. In the New Testament, Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Corinthians. The God of this world has blinded their eyes and that's exactly what we find. The God of this world, little g, which we know there is no, there is only one big G God, and that is our Heavenly Father, the Creator. But the God of this world, Satan, who has some, some power, whom God has, has given some need to, to be able to influence, uh, tempt people in this world, has blinded them. They cannot see spiritual truth. And when pride comes into our lives and we're caught up in sin, what we find, first of all, is that we are blinded to the things of God. We can't see the spiritual things that are there in God's Word. We look at the Word, but it says nothing to us. We look at how God's working, but we can't recognize what God's doing or that it is God's good hand at work in someone's life or in our life even or in the world. They lack spiritual truth. They cannot see because they are spiritually blind. Secondly, he says they cannot know. Because they lack knowledge. They lack the knowledge of God. And Paul says that that knowledge we have is spiritually discerned. It has to be. It has to come from God. It has to come from His Spirit. And pride will, will numb us to the knowledge of God's Word and the knowledge of God's will and the wisdom that God wants us to have in, in living for Him. And then he says they can't, they can't share spiritual truth either. He says they cannot bark. They cannot bark. Uh, speaking in terms that we can understand of a, of a pet, of a dog. I remember a friend of mine had a, a little dog that stayed in the house, and that dog barked constantly. I mean, it was constantly barking, but it never did anything to you. It never would bite you, but it would bark and bark and bark. And what I found uh, most of the time is the dog you have to watch out for that's going to bite is, is not the dog that barks all the time. It's the one that's silent, the one that doesn't say anything. And so what we find here, they cannot bark. They cannot share spiritual truth, uh, it says here. They cannot bark. They cannot share that spiritual truth. And if, if they're looking to do anything, they're just looking to bite. They're looking to get what they want rather than what God wants. They are damaged. But he also says those who are prideful, those who are caught up in the sin of idolatry and in looking to self and looking to others are those who are dreaming. Those who are dreaming. Look at verse 10. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. That means lazy when it comes to the things of God. Um, they love not sleep, the Bible says. Lest thou come, love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Um, open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. That's what Proverbs 20, verse 13 tells And what we find for those that are pri uh, prideful, usually, when we have that in our lives, we're looking, we're looking to dream up some sort of scheme, some sort of way to get ahead in life, some sort of way to benefit ourselves rather than looking at the ways of God. It also says those who are prideful are driven. They are driven. Verse 11, yes, they are greedy dogs which never have enough. 
never have enough. When pride gets a hold of your life, you can never have enough of what you want. There's never quite enough money. There's never quite enough power. You've never climbed high enough on the ladder. You always want more, and you're driven. You are driven to want more for yourself, uh, driven to want more that makes you happy and, and gives you joy in life. They have an appetite for worldly things, and we see this all the time. The, the, uh, the lust of the eyes begins to draw us to the world and to the ways of the world. When the Bible clearly tells us that we're to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And so they're driven with that appetite for worldly things. Also, for things of the flesh. Things of the flesh. And that lust of the flesh certainly is strong. And it has a pull on people uh, as well. That's why you see so many people who think the grass is greener on the other side. And so they walk away from a marriage, from a relationship, and walk away to someone else or to something else. We see that they, they have that uh, care for the things of the flesh. And then also we see uh, selfishness come in as well. It's a me, me, me society. You know, the slogan is, you deserve a break today. Take that break today because you deserve that in your lives. I'm worth it. I mean, these are the slogans and the things that we hear. When we, when we must recognize as God's children that, hey, we're not worthy, but God is. And God loves us, and he's made a way for us to be driven towards the things of God, not towards the things of the world. And then many times, those who are prideful become distracted. Look at verse 12. Come, one says... I will bring wine. We'll fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today and much more abundant. They become distracted. They don't look past the moment. They they look at what we can do together to get together and and do the things that we want rather than the things uh, of God. I remember reading several years ago about an 84-year-old great-grandmother who loved to play uh, play in the casinos, and she would actually won a jackpot, $10 million in Atlantic City, and yet she still wanted to go back. She had that pull and that draw to go back and play more and play more and just try to win more and win more. You know what Proverbs 19.1 tells us? It says, Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. And so we must be careful that pride doesn't get us distracted away from the things of God. Then those who are prideful, ultimately, of course, they're going to be disappointed. If you look in chapter 57 and uh, verse number 10, it says, you are wearied in the length of your way, yet you did not say there is no hope. You have found the life of your hand, therefore you were not grieved. Disappointed. Verses 20 and 21 speak of this as well, especially 21, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. And so, uh, many times, Hopefully, the prideful will begin to realize that there is no peace apart from God. And if you think about uh, what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, he says, vanity is vanity, all is vanity. In other words, apart from God and loving God and serving God, there is absolute futility in life if you try to live apart from Jesus Christ. And so I would say we must be very guarded against pride in our lives, self-sufficiency in our own way, thinking that we are something and somebody and we can do everything on our own. But I want to tell you, here's the wonderful thing. When we recognize God and God's place, God is the king of our lives, God is the king of the world, God is the king of everything, and we're not, then we begin to have that humble and contrite heart God lifts up and God exalts. The prideful will be abased. They'll be taken down. But those who are humble and contrite, God will lift them up and draw them near into God. I don't know about you, but I want to be near to God. I want to be near to Jesus every day. That's where I find my strength. That's where I find grace and and help in time of need. When God clears the path for that needy person. Would you look at me with verse verse 14 in... in, uh, Chapter 57, one shall say, heap it up, heap it up. One translation says, build it up, build it up. Prepare the way. Take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. I love that. Take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. You see what what that means? God is clearing a path. God is taking the obstacles out of the way. Now, I know we say often 
that God doesn't always take the obstacles out of our way, right? There are challenges before us. God doesn't always move those. But God helps us to get over those. Or God takes us around those. Or sometimes God just takes us right through. In it all, God is holding our hand, no doubt about it. But there are definitely times that we need to recognize that God removes the obstacles out of our way. And we must point to God and say, God, I know you did that in my life. And I'm so grateful and so thankful for you removing that obstacle out of my way. God says, take it out of the way of my people so that they can have a clear path. God does that. Not always, but I want you to know he's the only one who can. He's the only one can. Yesterday we had our grandchildren come over and uh, spend a little time. Judy's brother from Oklahoma was there. A brother from, uh, from uh, Red Banks came over. And so when my daughter got there with her, her children, Maggie is our youngest girl. She's two and a half. Hadley's our oldest girl and she's five. And so when Maggie got out and came running around the backyard where we, we were, Hadley met her, grabbed her, and picked her up. And Maggie immediately said, no, no, too heavy, too heavy. <laughs> Get me down is what she meant. Get me down. Get me off. Get me, get me away from this. <laughs> you know, there's some weight that I can't lift. I can do some, you know, but there's some things I can't do. Too heavy for me. Too heavy for me. I can't move it out of the way. There are things and challenges in my life I cannot move. I cannot lift. I cannot get them away. But I know one who can. I know my Savior can. And if he doesn't move that obstacle out of my way, I still know he's got my hand. And I know he's never going to let go. Never, ever. We can talk about holding on to God all we want to, but if you're his child, you're humble and contrite in spirit, God's holding on to you. And he's never going to let go of you. And he is able God speaks to needy people as well, those who are humble and contrite. Isn't that a marvelous thing? He speaks. Look at verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one, thus saith the Lord. That's what we find in the Bible. For thus saith the Lord. The authority comes from God because God is the God who speaks. He's not like one of those dumb idols that you just look to and it's never going to say anything to you, never going to interact with you, never going to do for you. But we have a God who loves us and cares and speaks to us. And God has given us his wonderful word and he speaks to us through that word every day. We can look, at, look to the word and God speaks. And he speaks through his Holy Spirit. And, and he speaks by his word. And he speaks through other Christians and speaks through the church. And God does a great work in our lives and God hears us. And we know this when we cry out. The Bible teaches us that. The Bible says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined his ear and he heard. He heard. He heard my cry. He brought me up also out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3. A new song in my mouth, because he's raised me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay. He has set my feet on a rock. He inclined his ear. He heard me when I cried out. You know what crying out to God signifies? It signifies a broken and contrite heart. It signifies a humble spirit. It signifies a needy person who knows they have to look to God. That he's the only one. He's the only one who's going to help and the only one that really can help us. For God answers when we cry out. Thus saith the Lord. We truly cry out for peace. He hears but our heart has to be open to him. I know we talk about our heart being right before God. The only way our heart can be right before God is if we trust him and if we know him. And if you haven't trusted him yet, the only way your heart can be right there again is really just the same way. You have to open your heart to God. You have to open it up. And you have to trust him. And you have to know that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he has a good plan for your life, and that he's going to bless you and see you through. He will answer. He will answer. He answers in his way. He answer, answers in his time. But we know God does answer. If we open our heart, if we trust him, if we're willing to follow him, if we're willing to, to obey his word, willing to forgive, willing to love God and love others, then uh, he's, he's going to do it. He's going to bring honor to himself. 
And he brings honor to himself by our witness that we trust God, that we love him, and that we just depend upon him. God reveals himself to the needy, of course. Uh, in verse 15, um, I will dwell in the whole high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. This is God speaking, right? God says, I will dwell. I will dwell with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to of the contrite ones, to revive it. And so God dwells with those who are needy. Contrite means to be crushed, to be crushed in small pieces or particles. When I read that, when I thought about that, my mind went back to the World Trade Center um, back on 9-11 when that horrible attack came upon our nation and those planes flew into that World Trade Center and, and it, just, it, it just went down almost into dust. And I remember talking to people who, who went there to do work, mission work, and as, as responders there, they talked about the thickness of the dust, the thickness of how it, it had been reduced just to dust and to rubble. It made me think about my own life. I mean, Jacob said it this morning in Sunday school, we're, we're, just, we're just dirt. We're, we're, our flesh is just made of dust, you know. But when our spirit is so crushed, we're reduced just to dust. And we recognize it. And God's there to revive us. Oh, we're going to talk about the resurrection come Easter in just a few weeks. God's there to revive us, bring us back to life. And he gives us new life through faith in Christ Jesus. When the world's crashing in on us, and it seems like we're just reduced to dust. Remember this. I love this. He gives beauty for ashes. Strength for fear, gladness for mourning. And the Bible says, peace for despair. He does. He exchanges all those things in our lives that show our neediness to God's strength and God's help for each and every one of us. So he rebuilds our lives. And that's what we find uh, in verses 15 to 19, that he rebuilds us. To revive the spirit of the lowly, revive the heart of the contrite, um, the Bible says, though the Lord be high, yet, he hath, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth from afar. Psalm 138, verse 6. And again, who are the proud? Those who refuse to totally surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. To acknowledge God. To, to refuse to let God revive and bring them back to life. So many times I hear people say, God helps those who help themselves. But you know, that's not really a true statement. God helps those who are willing to acknowledge their need of God and their need of help and look to Him by opening their hearts and opening our lives to our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are crushed, those who are contrite, those who are lowly in spirit. It's a great understanding of God. I mean, Isaiah was a masterful writer, but he did so inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write to us exactly what we needed to hear. To the Israelites of, of those many years ago and to us today, sitting right here, to see who God is, how often he is the king of the world, he is the king of my life, and to see who I am and to see my great need of God. And it's my prayer that I would never ever like a Pharisee who would stand and pray thus within myself and thank God that I am not like other men, that I'm not an extortioner uh, or an adulterer or even like somebody else, even like this tax collector, and that I would toot my own horn and say, I give this and, and I do that and I this and I that. But be, to be more like that tax collector who would not even lift his eyes up to heaven but smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the attitude God believes. That's the person God is able to work through and wants to work through and does work through. And if you want to be prayerful and look to self and look to, to your idol, your idol of self, well, God will let you do that. But he's not going to bless you with that. You won't find your help in God when you have that attitude. But rather when we have this lowly and contrite heart. And I just pray that... Uh, 
that I always recognize God is high and lifted up and cares about me especially when I'm crushed and when I've been beaten low by the damage of the difficulties of life and yes, even my own sinfulness and my own prideful attitude. Too many times we look and we say about someone who, who, um, who falls in a bad way, we say, well, maybe it's what they deserve. But I'm thankful we have a Heavenly Father who says, let me give you what you don't deserve. Let me give you what you don't deserve. And that's the grace of God. And then by not giving us what we do deserve, we receive the mercy of God in our lives as well. Here's what Jesus said. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's not those who are whole that need a doctor. But those who are sick, not those who are whole that need a doctor, but those who are sick. Let's pray. Our great physician, we cry out to you, recognizing that. Many times we find ourselves in the emergency room of life and our need is so great because we're so sick. And we're in need of healing and wholeness. And only you, Father, can provide that. In our brokenness, in our humility, in our contriteness, we recognize that we find you. In our pride, in our self-sufficiency, in our selfishness, there is no peace. No peace. And Father, we are so in need of the peace that passes all understanding. And we know that that peace can only come when we have peace with you. And peace with you, we know, only comes through a relationship with you, through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Trusting him in everything. Trusting him as the one and only Savior of our lives, of the whole world. We thank you for our dear Jesus. We thank you for our Savior who died on that cruel cross rose again the third day, that we might have eternal life through faith in all that he is and all that he has done for us. Father, thank you. We praise you today for that. Lord, help us to walk in your ways, to humble ourselves before you, and let you exalt us in due time. Father, I pray for the needs of everyone here today under the sound of my voice, for our wonderful, marvelous church family for how you've blessed us, Lord, and how you continue to bless. May we walk in humility as a church, recognizing that you are our great shepherd. And we look to you, Father, for guidance, for protection, for for provision. Lord, you alone can provide all that we need. Father, I pray for those here today, today who need the provision of salvation, those who are lost. Father, would you show them their need to repent and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, to turn from their old way of life and trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. I pray, Father, that those who are lost today and need that will be saved, Father, that they'll give their heart and life to Christ and come forward and make that public so that we might rejoice with them. I pray for other needs, Father. You know our church family. You know those that are here today and what our needs are. Lord, help us. Express those to you, Father, and to work of healing and grace and peace in our Father, if there are other public decisions that ought to be made, Father, you know our hearts and we know what you want. Your spirit is here strong among us. May we certainly, Lord, today just open our hearts and lives in full surrender to you, all for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand as we sing our hymn of response. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me
Thank you for your prayers and your kind attention in the service. I want to say a word of thanks to all those who uh, were able to come and help yesterday. I know some would like to have and and were not able to, but those who were able to, thank you for doing that. We had a a good cleanup day, a good work day here in the church and also uh, in the the house in the parsonage. And uh, ladies, some of the ladies fixed lunch for us and even had had peach ice cream. Thanks to Jessica up there. And it was, it was marvelous. Had a good time of fellowship around the table and, and just a good time of working together. It strengthens our fellowship when we're able to do things together like that and uh, recognize that this is, God's, this is God's facility. Everything belongs to Him, and we just want it to be the best that it can be for, for His honor and glory. So I thank you for that. To our guests, we're glad you're here today, and we welcome you to come back and worship with us. Always glad to have you worshiping with us. And, If I can help you in any way, please don't hesitate to let me know that. All right. Anything else before we dismiss? Discipleship training at 5.30 this afternoon. Worship at 6.30. Love to see you back. All right. Let's bow together. We'll have our closing prayer. Billy, will you voice this prayer for us?